No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great lineup today, and here's what's coming up. We're going to begin with our devotional time, as we always do, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be in the Old Testament, looking at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, where God explains to the children of Israel that they can indeed achieve salvation. It's a great passage that gives us hope. I can't wait to look at that text with you together. Get out your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy 30, and I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Roger Campbell is ready, as always, to answer a question from the Word of God. Today's question comes from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and it's one that you won't want to miss. Jim Dearman's in the studio with us, and he's got some sound words about being walled in. Then we're blessed to have Freddie Clayton with us again. He'll be looking at heaven and hell and asking if they are real. In our final segment, Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin will repair our understanding about Matthew 16, verse 3. Does this passage teach that Christians should look for signs of Jesus' second coming? It's a great question, and they'll look at the context of the passage and give us an answer from the Bible. Well, I hope you have your Bibles opened up to Deuteronomy 30 so we can read together. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love And covers me there with His hand And covers me there with His hand A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord He taketh my burden away he holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God for such a redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. 
dog that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. The book of Deuteronomy, uh, this was written as a reminder to the Israelites uh, just in those few days before they entered the land of Canaan. They just finished wandering in the wilderness and were about to go into the promised land. In chapter 30, we're near the end of God's instruction of the people through Moses. And as our passage begins, he says, this commandment which I command you. He's not talking about a single command, but the entirety of the law that was given to them. We read that law mostly in Exodus and Leviticus, and it's restated and reinforced in the book of Deuteronomy. We're not talking about just the Ten Commandments here, but all of the laws that were given as well. And as we understand that Old Testament law, it was given just to the Israelites, Exodus chapter 24, verse 8, and it was for a limited period of time, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And the purpose of that law was to point them to the Messiah, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. So he's talking about this law. He says it's, it's not in heaven. He's giving these illustrations to help realize that we can understand what he says. It's not in heaven. It's not impossible to get to. It's not beyond the sea, which would be incredibly difficult, especially back in their day. God didn't demand of them something that they were unable to do. His word wasn't so distant that they couldn't get to it and obey it. You see, obeying that law, that's a choice. And that's exactly what we went on to say in verse number 19. He says there they need to choose life rather than death. And how do they choose life? By obeying the law that he'd given. Choose to obey God rather than suffer. And Freddie's going to be talking about that in just a few moments. It reminds me of Joshua chapter 24. You know that sign that so many people have on the wall in their house? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Well, if you look earlier in that passage, Joshua is saying, hey, you need to choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve. God's close enough that we can see His will, we can know He exists, and we can make a choice to serve Him. You see, God doesn't demand of us what it's impossible for us to do. He does everything He can to help us. He's got a lot invested in this, including His Son. And He provides promises that we can take to the bank, so to speak. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This is not impossible. He's always going to give you a way out. And realize that even when we choose wrong and we don't take the right way out, God doesn't demand perfection. He says, if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8. Another important point here is His Word is not impossible for us to understand. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, he says that the truth has been hidden from the wise and revealed to the babes. You see, understanding the law of God, it's not a matter of the intellect, it's the matter of the will. Is this something I desire? Is this something I choose? It's a simple choice, not some complex philosophical quandary that some people try to make it out to be. You see, even the existence of God is obvious. People who try to deny that, they're without excuse, Romans chapter 1, 
verse number 20. The psalmist said in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The evidence is all around us and we have a choice to make. And that choice is more than just saying Jesus is Lord. It also includes doing what he says. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27, and see if that is not the case. He also said in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. If you want to be saved, those are two things that you've got to do. And he is faithful. He wants us to stick through to the very end, to continue on. He says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's baptism. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God has invested much in you, including the death of his son. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to make it to heaven. And it's something that is achievable. And that is good news for us today. Now, Roger Campbell will be examining 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So you may want to get out your Bible and turn there now. Roger's going to be answering the question, does this verse teach that lost people can be saved through prayer? Be ready always. I'm sure that you've noticed that some Bible verses are mentioned and quoted more often than others, and we understand why. Well, one Bible verse that is mentioned frequently is 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Does that verse teach that a lost person can be forgiven or saved by praying to the Lord and asking forgiveness? Let's read what that verse says. 1 John 1 and verse number 9. If we confess our sins, he, and the context indicates God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that a good verse? It's a great verse. It's a Bible verse. Do you know where we constantly see that verse? In tracts or booklets that humans have written, often about the topic of salvation, near the end of that tract or booklet, there'll be a quotation of 1 John 1 and verse 9, and the message is, if you've not yet been saved from your sins, confess your sins, and the Lord will forgive you, and they quote that verse. Are we opposed to people quoting the Bible? Never. But it's also important as we reference a verse or quote a verse to make certain that we pay attention to the context. You see, my friend, the message of 1 John 1 and verse 9, confessing sins and being forgiven by God, that's not for non-Christians. Here's an admission. The word church is not used in the book of 1 John. The word Christian is not used in the book of 1 John. But the proper conclusion is this was written to those who already were God's children. How do we know that? Well, in 1 John 2 and verse 12, the Bible says, I write unto you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. These were forgiven people. And then in chapter 5 and verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So it's written to people who possess eternal life. So the message of 1 John 1 and 9 to confess sins and pray for forgiveness that is for those who already are God's children. When God's children sin, how can they be reconciled to God? How can they have their sin forgiven? By confessing their sin. You say, well, what about repentance? That's a really good question. There was a man by the name of Simon. 
Simon the sorcerer. When he heard the gospel, he believed and was baptized. That's what the Bible says, Acts 8 and verse 12. Sometime thereafter, he committed a sin. And the apostle Peter said, here's what you need to do. You need to repent and pray for forgiveness. Acts 8 and verse 22. But remember now, Simon already was a follower of Jesus. When we read in the book of Acts about lost people asking the question, what must I do to be saved or what shall we do? They're never, never told to pray. They're told to believe and repent and be baptized, obey the gospel, and that's how their sins are forgiven. 1 John 1, 9, a great verse, but it doesn't teach salvation for lost people through prayer. My name is Roger King, and this has been Be Ready Life. Once again, we see that the context is so very important to understand what a passage really means. Now it's time to grab some paper and something to write with so you can enroll in our free Bible correspondence course. Remember, they're given free of charge. We're not going to solicit anything from you. We're not going to try to sell you anything. And after this brief break, Jim Dearman is going to be with us. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. I hope you got our contact information. If you didn't get it, you can get it from our website, gnttv.org. It's right there at the bottom. Here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about being walled in. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. A drunk came out of a bar at 2 in the morning and walked right into the nearest light post. His vision impaired by inebriation, he felt the post carefully as he walked around it three or four times, examining all sides of it with his hands. Finally, he slumped to the ground and sobbed. It's no use. I'm walled in. Well, sometimes the choices we make wind up walling us in. You see, the devil doesn't want you to be sober. He wants to intoxicate you, if not with wine, whiskey, or beer, then with spiritual intoxicants and influences. Satan is slick. He can make poison look pleasurable. What he wants you to lose sight of completely is that wrong choices, unless corrected, will wall you in and ultimately lead you to the place of wailing and gnashing of teeth for all eternity. Thanks for warning us about those traps, Jim. All of our past programs are available on demand through our website, gnttv.org. Just click on the archived and current programs on the black bar at the top of the website. Programs are also available through the Good News Today app for your phone, for your tablet, for your Roku, or your Apple TV. We also have a daily podcast available, Good News Today, Daily Devotional Time. Subscribe to it whenever you get your, wherever you get your podcast and get a dose of good news today and every day. Now, Freddie Clayton's going to answer the question, are heaven and hell real? Here's Freddie walking and talking in the light. We read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you do what you do? I heard the observation made many years ago that people are what they are religiously for the same reason they are what they are politically. They were born that way. My friend, that's not a compliment. 
We want to challenge your thinking. We want you to have the desire to study God's Word for yourself and learn what the Scripture says. With this in mind, you might be surprised to learn that heaven and hell are real places. Many do not believe in the reality of heaven and hell. Others believe that heaven is real, but that hell is not a real place. However, the Bible teaches the reality of both. Heaven is a place of rest for those who are righteous before God. It is a place of everlasting life, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. But as real as heaven is, hell is also. Hell is a place of eternal punishment for those who have rejected God, a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, Mark chapter 9, verse 48. Along with this same lines, it also might surprise you that there is a day of judgment coming. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, Paul reminded the Ephesians, the Athenians of this very matter. We will all give an account of ourselves to God on that day. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Are you ready for the judgment day? The Bible teaches us to repent of our sins, to confess the name of Christ, and to be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. It is our plea that you search the Scriptures daily and find out whether the things you have been taught are true. Take only God's Word as the final authority. This is the only safe course to follow. Freddie, thanks for challenging us to examine the Word and ourselves as well. You can hear good news today on Truth.fm, which is an internet radio station that streams 24-7. They have a Good News Today channel that's dedicated to playing episodes of Good News Today. There are also several other excellent channels that are worth exploring as well. In just a moment, we'll be repairing our understanding with Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. Now, Guyton and Troy are going to repair our understanding about Matthew chapter 16, verse number 3. Does this particular passage teach that Christians are to look for signs of Jesus' second coming? Here they are now. Hey, Troy, you know, you think about jobs. People always want you to be right and do everything right. But there's one job out there that you know, it's kind of like if you get it wrong, they expect it and ah, so be it. But then if you get it right, they rejoice. What job is that? <laughs> I think that would probably be the job of a weatherman. <laughs> 50% right, 50% wrong. About like our weather. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think about that and I don't want to make the light of them, but um, it kind of leads us to today's question. Okay. Because Jesus talked about being able to predict weather um, in Matthew chapter 16, 1 through 3. Okay. And uh, the question is, does Matthew 16, 3 teach that Christians today need to look for signs of Jesus' second coming? Hmm. The simple answer to that? No. no. <laughs> All right. Uh, in, in fact, let's just clarify about Jesus' second coming. Are we supposed to be looking for signs at all about that? Are there predictions about uh, when that's going to take place? Uh, there are no predictions about when that's going to take place. In fact, the Bible is very clear. And Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my father only. He even tells his disciples later before he ascended into heaven. He says, 
it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Peter goes on to affirm that in chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, when he says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So clearly, no one knows whenever Jesus is going to return, when the earth is going to end. There is no sign for that, so we don't need to look for that sign. So the only thing uh, that, that we can know about it is that it's going to happen. Right. What will happen if we're unprepared for that day? So right. the lesson is that we need to prepare. But then if we start studying the book of Revelation or we start studying Matthew 24 or, or even Matthew 16 and we start trying to put a time as if that's a sign of what's of when it's going to happen, then we know we're not studying correctly. That is exactly right. In fact, Matthew 16 is very clear. These Pharisees and these Sadducees were coming and they were trying to disprove Jesus or wanting him to say who he was. They even said, let him come down off the cross and we'll believe in him. Well, we know that's not true because as we've seen, Jesus already did all those signs. The important point of Matthew 16 is that he is saying the signs are here. You need to not worry about that. You need to recognize I am the Messiah and you need to get your life right with God now in this day and age. Don't worry about looking for signs for the future or anything like that. Exactly. 16.3 says, and it, um, well, let's back up to verse 2. He says, when it is evening, you say it'll be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning, it'll be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. Jesus has already given them signs. Mm -hmm. He's not giving them another one because they are rejecting it, just like you said. And so he actually says, uh, later on in verse four, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that's a reference to the three days that Jonah spent in the belly, uh, of the whale or the great fish. And it's a reference to Jesus going to spend three days in the Hidean realm at when he dies, but be resurrected. And in fact, uh, many of these Pharisees and Sadducees could be, be the very ones in acts two that finally with the scene of that sign come to the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. It's so important that you check what we've taught you against the teaching of the Scriptures and make sure these things are so. Be sure to look at the context and make sure that everything you hear is taken in context and not taken from the context. And you can watch any of these segments or the entire program again on our website, on our apps, or even on our podcast. Don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or if you'd like to enroll in one of our Bible correspondence courses. We love to hear from you. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. Always good news, good news, good news. There is good news today. There is good news, good news. The world. Always good news, good news.